Kayla Reese, it's great to sit down and talk to you. Before we talk about the small matter of you being just two wins away from being crowned the undisputed super lightweight champion of the world, I read a great, a great quote earlier and it said, to first understand Kayla Reese as a fighter, you must first understand the person. Your Native American heritage is, is such a massive part of your identity, isn't it? And connecting with your roots from a young age has always been something you've, you've, that you've held very dear and it's always been very important to you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one thing that I can go back to. Um, it's my roots. It's why I even fight in the first place. It's that spirit, that unexplainable feeling that I get. It's hard to put into words why I'm so proud of being who I am, Indigenous Cape Verdean, and just everything that makes up McQuinnanaga, Kaylee Reese, and um, the, being Indigenous and Native American is just something I'm really, really proud of. That name you just mentioned there, what can you tell us about that? Because it translates to, to many feathers, many talents, because some people, maybe some boxing fans, haven't quite joined the dots of what that name means. And it's a name that you carry to the ring with you, don't you, every time you fight as well? I carry it when people can pronounce it. <laughs> but it's McQuinnanog meets many feathers, many talents. Basically, I'm just um, a woman who wears many hats. I have a lot of feathers in my cap. And my mother named me that. And she, had, um, she named me very correctly because I do have many talents. And I'm one of those people that I'm going to figure out how to do it the best way I can possible, no matter what it is. So... Um, you know, I, I look at boxing as, you know, it's a sport, but it's an art and it's something that you can always learn. And um, that name is stuck with me and I'm excited to see where else I can find talents too. And you mentioned your mother there. Growing up for you in Providence, Rhode Island, you were the youngest of five children, I believe, and a single parent household as well. I can imagine that must have been an interesting environment to have grown up in. It was. I'm the baby. Um, I have two brothers and two sisters older. Um, you know, everybody set the examples, whether they were good or bad <laughs> examples in the household. But I'm the only child between my father and my mother. And, um, you know, there was some interesting times going growing up. But, um, you know, I was blessed to go through it all. And um, I get so much support from my siblings. Um, we are very, very close. And, um, you know, my mom has a lot of strength being, you know, single parent. Um, raising me because I was a psycho, <laughs> but um, it was fun growing up though, it was fun. Your inroads into sport, uh, I've been reading, actually just came from wanting to do what your brothers were doing, right? Just do copy of them, basically. I mean, that's who my babysitters were, they were my two older brothers, Aaron and Drew, and they played basketball, so I wanted to play basketball. I mean, my mom would dress me in these cute little outfits to go to school, she would leave and I'd go raid their cabinets in their closets to, you know, get the the early 90s gear with the Tommy Hill figure, you know, I just wanted to be just like them. They're my real life superheroes and they rap, so I try to rap. They skateboard, I try to skateboard. I just wanted to be and do whatever they did. And it's fair to say, I think, another line that you said, at a young age you grew comfortable with being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. which for a young child should never have to be having those sort of thoughts and going through the type of things you did. Was the decision to put on a pair, a pair of boxing gloves. Did that stem from that? Was it an escape for you in some ways? It was, and um, you know, I feel from birth I always had a fight, whether it was fight for love, fight for attention, fight for acceptance. You know, um, racially I wasn't Native American enough for the Native Americans. I wasn't Cape Verdean enough. You know, I was, I had these welfare thick glasses with these braid ties. I was Native, but people didn't get it. You know, I always were, was fighting for acceptance and. Now I realize that I was fighting so hard to get accepted, but, but now I embrace it. I'm just not, I'm just me. I don't fit in any box. You know what I mean? Um, very sporty all the time, but, um, you know, artistically, expressively, I just needed another outlet. And the boxing gym was the first time that I could focus on what was exactly in front of me without all the other chaotic things that I had to worry about all the time. And that chaos, fighting warrior gym, it was quiet for me and um, it found me. I was very interested in it at first, but being from Providence, Rhode Island and not really being from a boxing family, I just thought I had to go to New York, Philly, something like that. Um, but having that warrior spirit and actually, you know, getting my ass kicked my first amateur smoker fight and I could have took a left or a right. I could have said, this isn't for me. I never want it to happen again. I took a hard right and I said, how do I make that not happen again? I don't like this. I want to figure this out because I have always had to figure stuff out on my own. Is that part of the reason you are the character you are now? Because you have truly accepted who you are and you love who you are now. Absolutely. I mean, everybody's a work in progress. Um, but, you know, even early on in my career, my, my fiancé had, had mentioned this one morning and it kind of hit the nail on the head where, like, you look like in the beginning of your career you were, you know, punishing yourself and not being accepted, um, not feeling worthy, you know, 
understanding the type of genetic genocide that runs through an indigenous person's veins without even saying a word is kind of made sense because I never, I showed up kind of apologizing for existing and without not saying it, you know, very reserved. You know, I stick out like a sore thumb because I got a lot of stuff going on and just my energy, but he was right. You know, I was just didn't really think I was worthy or I was even, I didn't accept that I was as good as I was at first because I didn't think I was worth it. So work in progress and I'm very proud of who I am now. Every part of it, no matter what it is, good or bad, I'm an open book and I'll talk to you about anything. And prior to those amateur days, which we'll come on to talking about, it was a, a friend of your mother's, I believe. And was it a storage room or a single bag was, was hanging up in a, in a small room, I believe, which is where you began to sort of learn and understand the basics of boxing. And it was the romantic side that we see in gyms, the blood, the sweat, the tears of a, a proper boxing gym, which you really fell in love with. Yeah, I mean, his name is uh, Domingo Tall Dog, and he's from the Narragansett Nation, and he's also a jewelry maker. He was a fighter um, in the early 90s um, contender around Connecticut, um, which is like New England area. And uh, we'd go to powwows every summer. It's basically a gathering of Native American peoples. And he'd have a jewelry um, stand and I would bug him between the dances that we do. Like, I heard you're a boxer. I just, just show me some things. And he would just brush me off, you know, in his very New England accent. Hey, you know, I'm good. Hey, girls ain't supposed to be doing this. You know, he just didn't want to hear it, but I was relentless. And um, he, I finally convinced him, my mom convinced him to come by the house showed me a few things and he actually brought a heavy bag, he put it in our closet. I thought I was badass. I watched Girl Fight and he showed me a few things. I was, it was it, I was hooked. And um, he, you know, he kind of put it, he kind of wanted to shut me up. And from there I'm like, no, no, this is like, I need to go to the gym. Um, but he, yeah, he started me off as he was like my target. Like I found somebody that knows something. Now I need to pursue this person and bother him. And I always ask fighters this question when they're preparing for their first world title fight or they've just won their first world title. After falling short against Christina Hannah and Hannah Gabriels as well in 2015, when you did win that WBC world title a year later in New Zealand, a hugely special night for you in so many ways, but when you reflect on the journey to that point, being virtually self-promoted and, and getting yourself to that point on your own back really with, with not much help at all, when you did hear those words and the new, what was going through your mind? Was it a lifetime of hard work summarized in those three words? Yeah, and it was short lived too. I mean, I was, I wasn't surprised because I knew I was supposed to be there at that point. I kind of got a glimpse, um, but it was kind of like, a, I told you, because I got told all my life of what I wasn't gonna be, what I wasn't supposed to do. And from what I got told, I wasn't supposed to be there. So it was a very proud moment, like, aha. But it wasn't just for me, it's for my people. Like all my, like we don't have representation, like people that look like me are from my background. So it was um, an aha moment, like, got you. I'm supposed to be here. So it was a, a really good moment. And then it was like short lived, cause I'm like, okay, now what else, what else do we need to do? You know what I mean? Yeah, you just said it there, but being the spiritual person you are, you always felt, that everything you'd been through was leading you to that point, didn't you, to become a champion of the world? Absolutely. I mean, this is where I'm supposed to be. It took me a long time to believe it. Um, but, you know, this is my gift. I, I'm, I'm, I'm able to be really good at something. And um, it's gifted to me by what we call the creator. So we're taught to, if you have gifts, it's no sense of keeping it to yourself. So I want to share it. And, you know, I believe in energy so, so much that I believe, you know, I could, I'm not a politician by any means, but if this is something I can do to motivate some kind of change and show people that you can get the best out of yourself no matter where you've been from, because I've been through some shit. <laughs> and you, you did uh, lose the belts in that, as you, you touched on it there, that second fight with Hammer, but then 2018, you know, you worked hard to get yourself back into title contention, did it with one of the best to ever do it in, in 2018 up at Weltweight, of course, Cecilia Breakhouse. Did you always have the determination and that self-belief you would become world champion once again. I did, I did. And it's funny because Cecilia Breakus was one of those fighters that when, when I first broke out into the professional ranks was somebody that I, I watched, not to be like, but just to see how she moved. I knew she was really good. And I used to say, I'm gonna fight her one day. You're not gonna fight her one day. And I knew um, that fight was kind of like the revamp of my career. Um, I remember specifically going into the fifth round because we had a lot of discrepancies going into that fight. Oh, that's a whole nother interview. But, um, you know, I had to wake up. And I remember Brian Cohen, he jumped in there. He wasn't even chief second. He said, yo, you're supposed to be here, Kay, wake up. And from then on, I knew I was supposed to be here because I kind of had a, I'm just happy to be on HBO kind of mentality at first. And then I woke up and from there, I knew it. I knew I was supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be a world champion. My, my career is not over by any means. I'm just getting started. And that's pretty scary. Was it just a special for you then in some ways when you did become world champion once again last year? 
It was. It was last year was a crazy year personally for me and for the world completely. But um, it was another uh, validation for myself that I'm supposed to be here. This is. I didn't think I'd ever be at 140. God bless. Um, but it was just another proof that yeah, you're supposed to be here and you're supposed to do great things and you're not. You're not done yet. You're not by any means. You're not done yet. Now this tournament, the road to undisputed. Um, a man you've mentioned who's tomorrow here, Brian Cohen, obviously a big part of that. But when it was first put to you as a, a concept, an idea, it was a no-brainer, I'm sure, for you to be involved in it. It's a special occasion, isn't it, for boxing? For boxing and for women's boxing. I mean, men's, we've had the Super Six and uh, style-type tournaments like this. But I was just saying this yesterday. It's kind of putting a blast on everybody. There's not going to be, there should be something like this in every weight class with men's or women's because there's no ducking. There's no defending your title against somebody that you cherry pick. This is the best fighting the best. And if you're not in it to fight the best, if you're in it to just fight in little stupid halls and kind of, you know, wear little outfits and dance around acting stupid, then, then you can go somewhere with this. This is, you have to fight the best. If you don't want to get the best out of yourself in anything that you do, why do it? So this is a no brainer. I want to, always wanted to fight the best because it brings the best out of me. So absolutely, this needs to happen in every weight class. And of course, with victory, we'll add the WBO crown to your IBO and WBA straps, but you just touched on it there, the best fighting the best. It's always the most common gripe, isn't it, with, with boxing fans, that this just doesn't happen often enough. Do you think that's fair? It doesn't happen often enough. And I, sh I think something like this is going to motivate when they see the style of this, the anticipation. We know who we're going to fight. You know, the, even if it's just two fights, but if you have like a six or eight kind of like a bracket like this, this is really good for the fans, really good for the fighters. Um, it's good for me personally because I know who I'm going to fight. And I, regardless of whether we're friends or not, I know and it motivates me because I know they're training. I know when I don't want to run the extra mile, no, no, I know who I'm fighting, so I got to run the extra mile. It's just motivating for me. Talk to me about your opponent then, Jessica Kamara, coming off a good win against Heather Hardy, but... Talk to us about her and what sort of fight you expect in. What does she do well? She is, she, her composure, number one, her composure and her game face is like second to none. I, don't, I haven't seen that in boxing anyway, but especially with female boxing. Um, and she's improved quite a bit. You know, I was there, I commentated her last two fights against St. Ville and then against Hardy. And she beat Hardy in a very well fashion. And the only other loss party was Amanda Serrano, one of the pound for pound best right now. So I know she's relentless. She comes forward. She's in shape. Um, she's coming up to 140. So she's bu building more strength. Um, so I expect a very, very exciting fight. Styles make fights. And I think we both have really good styles to make a really, really good fight. I'm not going to lie to you. I think I'm better. I think I'm faster. I know I'm stronger. I know I'm bigger. I want this more. I just know that. I can say that with 100% confidence. And we were talking off camera there from within the same stable. Talk to us about how well you might know Jessica Kamara. And this is, again, what we love in boxing, the perfect example of just business. It's just business. When that bell rings, even sparring partners, I, you know, I spar one of the best all the time, Katie Taylor, and we're like trying to kill each other out in the ring, but we're friends outside and it's just business. And Jessica is very smart by taking the opportunity presented to her because in women's boxing, our, our, our pools are shallow. So she stepped up and I give her a hell of respect for that. And we're, I mean, we announced the uh, the fight in September in, um, in the UK the last time, then we went out to brunch and we were celebrating because this is what we need in women's boxing. This is, we're helping each other help women's boxing out. So um, I don't think it's harder. People keep asking, isn't it harder to fight your friends? I'm like, absolutely not. I think it's actually better. Like I said, motivation and, um, I just know she trains hard as hell. Um, you know, I was happy when she came out with her last fight with the Cobra Kai theme. Like, I, I was generally like, that's so badass, you know what I mean? So I just think um, this, this angle of uh, actually being kind of friendly and knowing each other, it's, I think it's better. I think it's a lot better. And in terms of how you feel within yourself at 140 pounds, you said there you never thought you would make super lightweight when you could have looked back to this stage earlier on in your career, but do you feel your strongest at, at 140? I do. Um, when I first made the weight, um, you know, I was like sticking my toe in the 40s. I'm like, I don't know, this is this bright idea that you have, Ryan, I don't know. But um, I know my body so well and I've been involved with boxing and kind of just obser observing um, that I knew I could do it. I knew by any means, I'm always, if I have a goal, I'm going to make it. The first time was kind of just making the weight. Second time I felt a little better. This time, I swear, I'm walking around this hotel, uh, probably the lightest super lightweight in the whole competition, you know what I mean? I found kind of um, my bread and butter with the, with the super lightweight. I do feel strong. Um, I should have been fighting 47-40 my entire career, but with no guidance and kind of just doing my own thing. Um, it's, I'm, I'm happy here, I'm happy here. And being a two-weight world champion, you've already achieved what 
so many fighters around the world can only dream of. But holding all the belts, I'm sure you visualise standing in your mirror holding all the belts in your room. But like that is what that's the true pinnacle, isn't it, to become undisputed champion of the world? That is the pinnacle. That is the um, you know after that. You know, I've won other world titles, but you know, it's like, and it's always a then one. It's one of those things that I think I'd, I'll be a little bit more satisfied for a little bit longer when I hold those belts, not if, when I do, because I know that's what I'm after. And there's only a handful of fights, you know, 13 years in the game, and I don't want to take these little fights anymore. Every fight means something. So these next two, two steps to get to the ultimate goal is just. It's exciting, man. It's motivating. And you just said there, Kaylee, becoming undisputed will only keep you satisfied for a little bit longer. I mean, that would keep most fighters satisfied for life, right? But yeah. do you feel you always need to have a new goal? When you, when you do become undisputed champion in your mind, will you feel you still won't be happy? Will you still be chasing more? No, I think I'll be happy um, and I'll be more satisfied. I mean, I know there's more opportunities out there, but because you know I've been clawing and scratching at this for 13 years, a tough career and um, kind of just falcon and a raven just kind of like finally getting out of the, the ashes and probably two long birds but anyway you know what I'm trying to say um, <laughs> you know it's gonna be one of those things that now I'm here I'm here to stay what happens after this is great but um, I'm always building other mountains but that's that's I feel that's where I'm supposed to be so you know just these titles are great to have but that's like I'm supposed to be here reigning here for a little while and when fight night does roll around and it's just yourself and Jessica Kamara in the ring and the referee and the lights go down have you visualized it in your mind how do you visualize yourself winning this fight I visualize myself winning this fight dominating this fight you know my last fight I was it was a horrible performance on my end I was ill I did the best I could so I have a lot to prove um, you know, again, I have nothing against Jessica, but, you know, holding nothing back, I want to beat the shit out of her. So nothing, you know, nothing personal, just business. But I have my own personal, not vendetta against her, but with myself and what I want to do for my team, for myself, for my people. Um, just know that my goal is to, and I've never, ever spoken like that. Like, you know, it's going to be a great fight. No, I want to beat the shit out of her. And you just mentioned it there, your people. We know you already play an important role in the community and hoping to just help people with your experiences and your knowledge going through perhaps similar situations that, that you did when you were younger. To go back there with all the belts as well, how, how inspiring would that be for them? I mean, just when I go to these communities and reservations, just with, just not even with the belts, just with my story, and the, they see me on TV or in uh, most social media, it's just... I mean, I always say that that's, you can take the belts. Just that response I get, and they see somebody like them, look like them from the similar background, and the hope in their eyes and the energy in those rooms when I'm speaking is worth more than any belts, any money. So when I go there with all the belts and they see even bigger, like I, they think I've achieved so much, but you can always achieve more personally, business-wise, whatever you, you dream of. So you, you, if you put a ceiling on your dreams, you only achieve you know, this much. I hope people can achieve what they can never dream, what they've never thought, because this is where I'm at. I'm a kind of walking, talking, living legend of that right now. You know what I mean? Well, Kaylee, I, I could sit and talk to you all day, but until then, until we catch up next time, I wish you the very best of luck on November the 19th. Thank you so much. Great talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.